Thank you very much. All right. But uh, I'm, I'm John Traeger. I'm from Kansas City. I went to school at uh, KU <clears throat> for the six years. Uh, I got the six-year 40-pound flathead degree is what I call it. It took me six years to graduate and six years to catch a 40-pounder on the river. And uh, the reason that's important is because it's a public river. And uh, you can't really brag about catching large fish in private lakes, but one on the river, you can always brag. Um, I was an environmental studies uh, major, natural resource management. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. And while I was in school, I worked on a fish farm, raising goldfish and shiners and uh, car, Asia, uh, not Asian carp, but we, uh, we did uh, the grass carp and catfish and most of what we did we raised goldfish for feeder fish at pet stores but that was a pretty great experience also from from being a suburbanite here in uh, prairie village to go work on a fish farm uh, i lived in lawrence for 10 years and that's where i kind of fell in love with the river uh, we used to come to the river at 435 by deffenbaum and the water intake the weir there and hang out there in high school but more or less just to get away from things. But uh, now it's it's a big part of my life and, and a big part of every, everybody's life, you know, that drinks water. And um, a lot of people don't understand that what we put in the water, you know, is, is what we take out of the water and we drink everything, you know. And, uh, and that's one big thing you learn from uh, spending a lot of time on the Kansas River. It's just the, how bumming it is sometimes. And, and besides the Asian carp flying out of the water, just the water quality itself is, uh, is some most people need to know about that really it's rare that anybody knows about the quality and the, and the different things that you see on the river when you go there, <clears throat> unless you see it firsthand. You know, um, I think everybody would probably... Uh, there might be a revolution if more people traveled on the river and saw what was going on. But uh, I moved, I lived in Lawrence for 10 years. That's where I fell in live, love with the Caw River. I used to hang out on the Bowerstock Bower Weir, which is a dam. And uh, I used to stay there sometimes 14 nights, you know, not staying there, but 14 nights in a row I'd go there to fish and trying to catch monster catfish. And that is... That's the best thing about the river, too, because you never know what you're going to experience. It's so magical, and, and, and it's a mystery. It's like I call the river my church. I tell people I'm going to church when I go fishing. It's just uh, the river's my higher power sometimes. You know, it's like when you can't, it seems like it gives me the peace that, that I need in life. It's just hanging out by the water, and I'm sure it is to you guys, too, or else you wouldn't be here in this group, but... It's a, it's a pretty important factor in my life. You know, I'm a guide. I've created, uh, my wife helped me uh, create a, gu a guide service. And so therefore I can always maybe, you know, work on the river also instead of just, so I can spend more time on the river basically and fish more and get paid for it. Um, but uh, I have some, all these pictures up here from last year. Uh, hooked up three people with catfish uh, over 80 pounds. And I gave you guys a newspaper also called the Sports Page. It's kind of like a glorified flyer that we use for advertising in the neighborhood for work. But I get to write a story. It's Even though I uh, didn't, did poorly in English in college, I've uh, been published about 30 times uh, fishing stories. So that, that means, uh, you know, there is hope out there. Um, 
But I, I hope you guys got a copy of that. And uh, that's a story from last year when uh, I think it was Tuttle Creek was releasing water and it made the Kansas River rise. And we went fishing and it was a great couple days of rising water. That's a big issue this year is that the fact that we don't, there hasn't been any water, you know, in the Kansas River. The Missouri River, I think, rose 10 feet in the last, or 6 to 10 feet in the last night. I was on it last night, and it was rising. I was watching things on the shore disappear throughout the night. It was rising so fast, you know, you know, 50-foot trees coming down and at night. And I had to run up to my anchor rope a couple times and push the trees off my anchor rope because it can, you know, cause chaos. But that's kind of one of your biggest fears that you get over is when you're fishing on the river at night, there's going to be a big, huge stick pile that comes down and takes your anchor rope down that will take your boat down. But I, haven't ha I used to carry a knife in the, in the bow of my boat ready to cut the anchor just in case that happened, but it hasn't happened. And um, I'm a little bit more comfortable with the river now, but you don't want to be too comfortable with the river because then you, that's when accidents happen. You always have to respect it greatly respect the river and any water over what is it six inches of water can knock a growing man down grown man down so water is one of the things you definitely have to respect and on the lakes when here I'm, i live in kansas and we fish a lot of kansas reservoirs and when it gets windy out there it's like an ocean five to six foot uh waves two weeks ago we had a fishing tournament at milford lake in junction city kansas uh, two of the boats capsized, uh, a couple boats got swamped, you know, they had to go to shore and get them pumped out, but uh, it's just something you don't want to play with, you know. Even on the, on the river, you see them, like downtown by the airport, that big clear spot on, like, I guess it's 69 or 9 highway, and that usually gets pretty big waves on a good south wind day. Uh, another, I'm also a board member of uh, Call Point Park. I helped start that uh, back when we when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. came and did the uh, with his book and and all the news crew was up there and they tried to you know turn it into a park. I showed up in my boat with a giant sign that said Metro Fishermen Need or KC Fishermen Need Metro Boat Ramp that I made out of a refrigerator box. My it was my first time I ever made a sign or a public protest or anything, but trying to do my part, which was already going to happen, but I tried to do something. But it's kind of a selfish reason, should I say, it, uh, that I enjoy the river so much because I like to fish for it. And that's one of the reasons I was in the call point uh, board member group is because I want to make sure that the boat ramp is there 24. It's awesome. It's 24 seven. You don't have to, you don't get locked in. You can like at Riverfront Park, you can that closes at 10, and you can always get out anytime you want, but uh, you can't go in after 10, which is, can be beneficial too for safety. But you know the uh, the Kansas River Call Point Park at Lewis and Clark Park is excellent. I mean, it's one of the best things that could have ever happened in my life, just because it's I call it my country club. It's a uh, it's it's a great park and and it's a great view. Sometimes that south wind can ruin your view with your old factories working overtime because of that that sewage plant at the west bottoms but or wastewater treatment and uh but i love call point uh that was another transition from coming from lawrence with one river the kansas river you know and falling in love with monster catfishing and then coming to kansas city it was like heaven because we had the missouri river and the kansas river so two big rivers, and once you're on the Missouri River, the Kansas River just seems like a meandering stream, you know. Sometimes there isn't flow. Like right now, the 15 miles uh, downriver from 435 by Legends, where Johnson County and Wyandotte County is, that water's actually moving up. It's moving almost against the, the flow because the Missouri River's flooding so much, it's pushing up the Kansas River. So it's kind of tricky to fish. Uh, it's just it's tricky to anchor and and fish like that um, 
a lot of times I mostly speak about how to catch technical things about how to catch fish and what type of hooks to use and and things like that and tackle and uh, I always say my four major steps in catching monsters or river monsters is uh, using the proper equipments number one uh, number two is like the location and the time everything has patterns like all of us we follow patterns and networking is huge um, seeing where everybody else is fishing calling knowing a good group of people and calling people all the time to see what's working or try to establish a, a, a pattern through a fleet type system like having a fleet of everybody else's boats and it's kind of dramatic too at times we always my buddy would start said we needed to start the real cat fishermen of Kansas City uh, club because there, there's so much drama involved and who catches what and how you hold them and everything and my fourth step on catching monster fish is fishing as much as possible I mean the more you fish the more likely you are to catch a big one that's key and practice like every other thing we do the more practice you have the better you are at it and uh, the, the it's a fifth step I'd say but that is protecting the resource and protecting the water you know we're always altering everything it's like we put up the wing dams I don't know how many years ago 60 years ago and I heard that that messed up the blue cat fishery and then finally they became adjusted to those wing dams and stuff and 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 that started becoming better and now it's really good but now they destroyed the wing dams again because they want to I guess for erosion in the in the metropolitan areas and the and the pallid sturgeon what whatever the pallid the endangered pallid sturgeon trying to increase its reproduction habitat or reproductive habitat i don't know if that's correct or not but uh now maybe the blue cats will have to try to figure out how to deal with the, all those wing dams being cut now or they'll probably like in the winter because of all the wing dams being cut in the Kansas City area, what I mean is the wing dam is the big rock outcropping that adjusts the water to the current side. Well, now that there's not as much barge flow, I guess they decided they would cut them and level them down so that the water goes over to that side. But uh, now that's probably going to make all the catfish have to readjust to that to that. Uh, structure change or alteration and uh, already what we found in the winter time it's hard to catch catfish here because due to the lack of those wing dikes there's those create large holes for the fish to winter in and now instead of we don't have any large holes around here you have to go rural or <clears throat> you know an hour outside of town we always say all our fish go to st louis for the winter we don't know if that's true or not, but it seems as though they just disappear in the winter and then in the summertime and spring when the rains come, they come back to Kansas City and then they work north and then they go up the Kansas River especially and then they hit the weirs and the weirs become an oasis, you know, like at the Johnson County water intake number two is, a, is an amazing place to fish when there's rain. Um, I wouldn't eat the fish there. I mean, there's been many, many uh, signs posted that say like regular consumption of bottom feeding fish from this area can result in long-term health problems. But I'm I'm pretty much uh, into sports fishing, so I I just go for monster fish. I don't really eat the fish. I just like to to catch fish and use light line for it. And uh, I've got a couple pictures up here. You know, on the screen, that's some guys have a radio, a t TV and radio show. Uh, show me outdoors, and that's Terry Atkin and Shane the Train Boils, and and I took those guys out fishing, and that looks like we are at uh, upstream from 6:35 in that bend, and that's a pretty good area to to fish. We last year I caught some large fish at up by 6:35. That's right across from a giant crane. We call it, it's across from the crane dike is what we'd say. Um, that's another thing uh, 
a lot of the local fishermen, we have all our own code names for all the different spots, like Lucky Town or Tiffany's Beach, or just so we know what spots which. And uh, Old Faithful, of course, and there's Goose Poop Island. That's the name of a spot. Um, but it's pretty important. Uh, we, I'm also a member of a group called KC Catfish, or KC Catfish, and then that's a tournament group, and that's a lot of uh, guys that come from all over the Midwest, pretty much, to fish for catfish. And this weekend, we have a large tournament at Call Point. Uh, they used to, when we first started about nine years ago, eight years ago, we'd, we'd have 12 to, three to 12 boats a tournament, and now we're having 30, 35 to 70 boats a tournament. So it's, it's, it's gotten a lot more popular which also puts a lot more strain on the fish. Um, that's been a big, <clears throat> a big issue uh, with the fishing also is handling the fish. You know, all our pictures used to be holding the fish like this or, you know, holding them by the mouth. Now that's considered a taboo. You don't want to hold the fish by the mouth because it might hurt the jaw or even like the hooks we use or circle hooks and, you know, now they have, they have fish grippers, plastic that you put in their mouth to help hold them, but those are even starting to look down upon. Now everybody wants you to cradle them. And so every year you learn new ways to, to be more protective of the fish, which is uh, if you show a picture on the Internet of you catching a 50-pound catfish, there's going to be all sorts of feedback. You know, people, most of it's negative, but, I mean, some of it's positive, but... You held the fish wrong, or you shouldn't have fished in the rocks during that month of the year because that's where they spawn, or whatever. It's mostly because you know when it's like everything else. When you start doing good things, people try to bring you down a little bit. But you know, it's like we wear. <clears throat> I usually wear gloves. A lot of guys don't, but that's actually been that fish there is is rubbed down from being hauled over the side the boat we don't do that anymore that's an older picture that's probably from seven years ago but now it's we when we when we catch a big one we take it to the shore and we put it in the water so it doesn't have any strain and we take pictures of it and then on the shoreline and then let it go and whereas we used to just net it put it on a stringer take pictures of it you know go, tote it around or sometimes take it all the way back to call point so we can get the city in the background but that's not something that the older guys do anymore. Some of the younger guys do that, and we try to tell them not to do that. But, you know, who's who to tell anybody anything? So, But, um, you know, I'm, I'll show you real quickly my, my tackle. One thing is that uh, I have this rod here. One of the main things about fishing for catfish is you have to have hardcore equipment. You know, this is... A weight of eight ounces or a half pound and that Missouri River is very 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 strong and so and I I use a thing called a three-way rig or in Wisconsin where my family's from we call it the, the Wolf River rig but it's just a three-way swivel with a light line on a weight and a big hook and this is a special catfish hook that's a dollar a piece and it's made by a, there's a big a new it's called Team Catfish, which is a big uh, catfish product line, and uh, that's that's generally what I use. And then this rod, if I caught a six or eight pound fish, you'd barely be able, even be able to tell. I mean, this is for the Missouri River. It's a solid, it's a very solid rod, and, and uh, you need solid equipment. And this is a uh, a pen reel, which is uh, it's a spinning reel, so it has an open bail so I can throw it farther and it has less tendency to get tangled up. It's an easier one to use. It's the next step up, I'd say, from a push button uh, Zebco type reel. <clears throat> but this has 40 pound line on it, which is huge line. Last year I caught a 250 pound sturgeon on 50 pound line. I've caught a 10 foot hammerhead shark on 20 pound line. You know, several different monster fish on light line and that's that's pretty much what i like to do i'm a sports fisherman that likes to catch large fish with light line and brag about it and uh you know i uh, a lot of the bait and uh 
you know, a lot of the bait I use is, is I catch it on the river right before I go. And of course, with the Asian carp, now we have a big problem with the Asian carp. You know, we, they jump in the boat and uh, you can get hurt by them. I've had the wind knocked out of me a couple times by Asian carp. I've had a guy's watch broken, you know, came in, busted up his watch and he had a bruise. I've had guys' sandwiches knocked out of their hands. Uh, hats knocked off, whatever. You know, I go through about two stern lights a year on my boat from the Asian carp. Uh, this year, it's been impossible to find shad. And shad is the, is the, is the native forage species that, you, that almost is everywhere. You know, it's in every lake. <clears throat> it's in every river, stream. You know, there's like, I don't know how many species of shad there are, but it's a main reason that they were having so much issues in the Hudson River uh, is because of the shad. People depended on shad, but the pollution in the Hudson River it was killing the shad population, and so therefore people weren't being able to uh, get commerce from the river. And, uh, and that they started, I think, working really hard with the Hudson River because of the American shad. Well, here we have the hickory shad and the gizzard shad, which are two different types of shad, and that's what all the fish feed on. But uh, all year long, I've been fishing, I've caught two shad in my net in the river, and usually you get buckets of shad and you use them for bait. And I think it's also because since they eat plankton like the Asian carp and the spoonbill that the Asian carp are drowning them out of food and supplies and that they're going somewhere else. I'm not really sure for a fact, but everybody has to go to when we like this this weekend we have a tournament at Call Point. So all the local boats will be going to Lake Olathe or Blue Springs Lake or all these other lakes throwing their nets getting shad there and then bringing them back to the river to use. Whereas Five years ago, we could go up in Turkey Creek or any creek, throw our net and get shad, but they're like disappeared. And I'm pretty sure that's a direct relationship because or a direct fault from the caused by the carp. Uh, the Asian carp is a pretty huge problem. Everybody talks about zebra mussels and how big of a problem they are. Uh, I think Asian carp, I mean, they're choking out the river, and I think if there's such a thing as biological carrying capacity of water that they're going to use it all up. Um, it's, it's amazing, you know, how big they can get and how many there are. But that's what I usually use for bait now. And, uh, and we, you know, what we do is when they start jumping, we do circles in the water. I call it corralling them, and I go in a circle at an angle, and they jump in the boat. And then we cut them up and use those for cut bait. And it's fresh, and that's usually the best bait. Most of all these fish I've caught were on, were on Asian carp. Um, you know, uh, and we throw our nets for that. You, know, you can catch fish on night crawlers and anything else. Like if you use night crawlers on the river, more likely you're going to catch a sturgeon or something like that. You know, shovel nose sturgeon. Sometimes we we'll, we'll catch the pallid sturgeon, and which is we call it the albino. It just looks like a big white sturgeon. And then we also have the lake sturgeon, which catch those sometimes. And uh, you can see that's the that picture there is of the Argosy Bridge, and uh, that wing dike's been leveled, so that's not that hole's not there anymore. But there's it's like that in the city. It's it's kind of a bummer for us because. We got to you know, go other places to, to hook into them in, in, uh, in the colder months when they go to holes. And uh, some general rules about fishing, you know, we deep, a lot of times deep water is the best in the daytime, and if shallow, shallow water is best at nighttime, you know, the fish will come into inches of water at late at night to feed. And sometimes when you catch them there, you'll hear them splash before you see your rod bend over because it's so shallow. And that's basically the easiest way to catch monster fish too is to go to somewhere sandbar, some sandbar, and start fishing around midnight and fish that whole morning. And the fish will shoal or push the bait up against the sandbar to eat them. Um, you know, it's a lot of structure. There's a... 
you know, I think it's, it's different because they have to adapt to all the different structure that we do, that we create. You know, now they're putting more rocks up in Atchison and stuff, and you can see all the new rocks. I try to stay away from those areas because it's something new. And uh, the fish probably haven't really set up on that uh, structure yet. Um, they say another good place to fish on the river is behind an old barge that's been there for years because it's something that's been established and, and the fish will use the current lines to feed in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, most of the stuff that I've learned about fishing besides just doing on the river, besides fishing on the river, is meeting and talking to elders and other men and women that have spent time on the river like Tom Burns, for instance, in Lawrence, Kansas. He was one of the last commercial fishermen, and I used to pick his brain a lot when he was uh, alive, and, and uh, he was like the godfather to me <clears throat> of catfishing. And because of his commercial fishing, he knew exactly where the fish traveled during the year, which was really interesting to me as a sports fisherman, so I could uh, catch him. But, um, you know, it's... The uh, the river is pretty pretty fantastic place. You, you know, you, we do a lot of bone and rock collecting. Um, we go to the wing dams and get out, look for bones and fossilized bison teeth. And uh, this year, I found a bison skull cap with the horn hooked to it. And my favorite piece is the, is the vertebrae pieces because in the bison they have the big long where the hump is. And those are like a special piece. They can stand up on the fireplace mantle at their own will, and they look pretty neat. Um, and finding arrowheads, and uh, I've ta taken people fishing or on. Well, last last couple of weeks has been all about morels. I've taken a few morel trips. People go look in the woods for morels, which I found my first morels last week and about 50 ticks. <laughs> And uh, I'm still itching right now from it, and and uh, I, I I don't you know, next next year I heard there's a stuff called Sawyer spray. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Sawyer spray, but you treat your clothes with it, and you spray it all over your clothes and let it dry, and then put that on. I'm gonna use that next year for sure if I do it again. Now my whole interest in morels after I cooked them, I didn't really enjoy them, so. Uh, if I do that again, it'd be for money. It's just, it's fascinating how much, how the earth gives us these things that we can make money on that people don't, you know, like you see on now with all this reality TV with the ginseng and the sea worms and, and, uh, you know, walnuts and all everything, you know, it's like, it's amazing. It's, it's kind of like everything has got like a gold value to it. Um, and I'm, a lot of the things, that I've learned from just from other guys. There's, there's other. Uh, there's a guy named Cat Daddy Shumway in Topeka who's quite the character, and everybody's got their own little niche of fishing ways. And uh, and I just I usually try to go to tournaments and and pick those guys' brains and bother them and and learn what they have to learn and then up at one, you know, make it my special way. Um, and that's. You know, and go to lots of tournaments. Tournaments are interesting. I mean, if you want to see something interesting, this, you know, if you're interested in fishing, Sunday, this Sunday at Call Point at 8 a.m. is the weigh-in, and there'll be like probably 30 to 40 super rigged up catfish boats and uh, and real diehard catfishermen, and it's an all-night tournament, so everybody will be real groggy and out of it. But it's uh, it's it's definitely a uh, a, a true love and and it wouldn't be there for the i mean the river is what it's all about you know it's and kansas city is just a really cool cool part of the river with a giant bend big bends attract big fish um it's nice because you don't need lights in kansas city when you're at night because of all the city lights that's a cool thing whereas when you go rural to like waverly or brunswick somewhere down outside of the city you know it's like pitch black at on the river i imagine on the 340 it's it's pretty dark in areas that'd be kind of scary but in kansas city it's a lot it feels a lot safer because we have lights 
And uh, and when the, the best thing I'd have to say about the fishing is, you know, the way to catch them is just to stick with it and, and just go a lot. And there's my boat at Call Point at the country club. It's my dad and the boat there. But that's a great view. I, I took a picture of the full moon over the city and sent it out for my Christmas card. And nobody believed me that it was in Kansas City. They're like, where is that? And I'm like, Kansas City. I'm like, no way. And I'm like, exactly. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing, except for the, the trash that litters the shore there, you know. And, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of things, you know. I, I hate to sit up here and talk about gross stuff, so I'll, I'll, I won't do that. But I'll tell you, you know, the first tributary that we come up to on the uh, way up the call, we, we coined it Condom Creek. And it's because of all the condoms and needles and toilet paper and everything. All the rocks are gray. And uh, there's a little rock island outside of it. And we call it Treasure Island because in the 51 flood, it went through the Argentine or Armadale area. And it was the old Turkey Creek Channel, I guess. And it distributed all everybody's cutlery and stuff in the rocks. And so you can find silver spoons and everything below that that. Condom Creek is like silver spoons and and jewelry and coins and marbles and but if you cut yourself you're going to get a staph infection so it's the island's cursed that's why we call it Treasure Island because you got to be super careful digging around in there for the treasure and and you know another thing that's that really amazes me is 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 uh is Condom Creek and last year I had a guy I had a guy I took him fishing. See, that's the picture right there that I was talking about. But I took this guy l last year fishing, and so he brought his children down to fish on Call Point. And his daughter was like, saw a condom and, and at his feet. And he was like, I don't understand why we can put a, a Range Rover or whatever on Mars, but then we have this trash flowing down our river, and I can't even take my children to the river to fish without having to deal with this. And he was like, you know, and a lot of people come to me and say, it's like, a, what's the deal? You know, what's all this? You know, I've got a needle in my throw net. And I'm like, <clears throat> you know, just jump on the train. You know, everybody, I mean, it's like, it's whatever, it costs a billion dollars to fix the problem. Or that's what I've heard, you know, at there at that Turkey Creek wastewater plant. I mean, that's horrible. I'm surprised we haven't revolted on that place. You know, that's that's ridiculous. I mean, I'm I, it burns me up in there. You know about that place. I mean, it's just amazing the stuff that comes out of there, and, and it just goes right into our drinking water. In Johnson County, I'm a, I'm I, I'm a, a resident of Johnson County, and our water intake is 500 yards downstream from Deffenbaugh. So when it rains, when it rains in Deffenbaugh, it comes out Mill Creek there and it used to be really bad you couldn't even roll your windows down in that area now they've got liners i guess and they, they actually they used to have air fresheners gigantic industrial size air fresheners out in the area to try to make it smell nicer i know one of the uh, i met a lady from holiday which is on holiday drive there where deffenbaugh is and she told me all all these facts but she says she loves watching people wait in line at a drinking fountain and how foolish they are, you know, in Johnson County because you got that water, you know, it's like yellowish and it reeks and then Johnson County sucks it right up, you know, 500 yards downstream. And most people don't realize, you know, I, I realize it's like one of the first things we learned in environmental studies is that you drink and, and use the water from everybody upstream. So you're basically, it's always recycled. And, and think about the poor people in New Orleans, you know, at the bottom of the river and what they have to deal with, you know, and their quality of water. And it all gets treated and we're all fine, but it is kind of nasty. You know, I, I met a guy Saturday. He was on his way to buy a water purifier because he said the tap water, he was sensitive to the local tap water. I'm like, huh. That's pretty funny, man, because I'll, let me tell you a little something about that tap water. But nobody realizes that, and it's, 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 it's like nobody really seems to care, but we all care, but can't really do anything about it, I guess. You know, there was a big article in the paper. Somebody, somebody called me and 
I, I hate telling people about all the gross stuff, but I think that's the most important thing, man, because, you know, personally, especially for the future of our children, or I mean, I don't have children, so whatever, you know, trash the water, whatever. But, you know, it's, it, you can't do that, you know. You got to respect it and, and take care of it, and, and you got to, I don't know, it's for the future, you know, people don't realize it. People need to wake up and see that stuff. And I, don't know, I know you guys, I saw you, I met you at the sports show, and I was like, hey, wait a minute, what about that creek? You know, that, that, that makes me mad. But it doesn't, it seems like, it seems like just, it's going to be that way forever, you know, or maybe 20 years, who knows, will it ever get changed. But... That's that's really what I'd like to share with you. I mean, is it, um, does anybody have any questions or any comments or?